Now, uh, dear uh, colleagues, attendees, and panelists, well, last but not the least, we have with us uh, Dr. Haysam Gamil, who is a consultant uh, of cardiothoracic anesthesia and ITU in Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. And uh, today he is giving us a lecture uh, on like the most recent and our day-to-day -day, uh, facing uh, situation. Uh, he's uh, giving us a lecture on anesthesia management for, for uh, bronchoscopy, uh, how COVID-19 changes our practice. Uh, can you start, please, Dr. Kaysen? Yes. I would like really to thank the, um, take the opportunity to appreciate really the one highlight the efforts behind this fantastic job, uh, behind this really um, mar marvelous uh, platform that really um, uh, became one of the uh, um, the main academy on the on uh, really on the scene, and um, the con I believe that the continuity and the sustainability of this online academic courses be the one of the effective methods in order to defeat the uh, impact of the COVID uh, on our life and or uh, on our uh, progress as well. Uh, moreover, I believe that actually giving this webinar gives us an opportunity really to meet a lot of, uh, of wonderful people from the different corners of the world. And, um, and my greetings for everyone, for Dr. Uh, Saad Mahdi, for Dr. Yasser, uh, for you, Dr. Ahuda, and for my dear speakers, um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Coleman and Dr. Tudor. I really enjoyed their speech. Um, I, I'm going to talk today about the anesthetic management for the bronchoscopy and how the COVID changed our practice. Why bronchoscopy? Because I believe that the bronchoscopy, um, apart from the other um, uh, types of the surgeries, we have like, some sort of intimate um, relation with our surgeons. There is no barrier between us because we are sharing the care of the, uh, the airway. Uh, it could be a minor procedure with a unique challenge for the anatomist um, in terms of having a patient comorbidities uh, and uh, marginal respiratory reserves. However, uh, we are sharing the same uh, uh, focus on the airway uh, with the surgeon, and this also could be an added challenge. And with the time of the COVID, um, we consider the, the bronchoscopy a, a super air, um, aerosol generating procedure, which recently add a, a further risk and further challenge for all of us, not only for the anatomist, but even for the surgeon. That's how usually we consider currently now our focus is to avoid the aerosol generating procedure in most of our practice on daily basis. What are the indications and for, for the bronchoscopy in general? It could be diagnostic uh, uh, for the bronchial new blood, for instance, or for the resistant pneumonia and to, to, to obtain uh, sub sputum cytology, um, to evaluate the tracheomalacia, or, to, or, or, or used also for in cases of tracheoesophageal fistula. Um, it could be used also for the airway assessment for a prolonged intubation and to examine the extent of the th thermal or heat injury or smoke injury for the airway and for in the cases of subglottic stenosis. It could be used also for therapeutic issues, I mean, for therapeutic purposes, um, in the issues for, for the removal of the aspirated uh, foreign bodies. Do you, we can use it for the uh, suctioning of the cupious um, uh, secretions um, uh, or for the particulate matter aspiration and the cases of lung abscess, uh, all the way down to the document, the proper position of a double human tube with the aid of the flexible bronchoscopy. And definitely it's very well known that it could be used also, especially the um, flexible fiber optic bronchoscopy uh, for the difficult intubation scenarios. It could be used also for preoperative evaluation of the before the lung resection to, to evaluate the, lung, the extent of the tumor and if this malignancy have a metastasis for the contralateral lung. Okay, currently, uh, which, which is which? Which uh, would be a more appropriate uh, for, for, for the patient using the flexible or the rigid? Definitely, this depends on, um, but let me take you back first to flashback to the history. It, back on 1885, 1897, um, the first rigid bronchoscopy has been performed by Gustav Killian. Mr. Gustav considered is the father of bronchoscopy, especially the rigid bronchoscopy. He used uh, osophagoscopy to extract a bulk bone from the trachea of a farmer. And up till 1911, he, he managed to take around 691 foreign body removed but, uh, with, with the, the aid of this rigid bronchoscopy. But the first flexible bronchoscopy had been done by Shigito Ikeda, 
the early years of uh, the, the 20th century, probably by 1920, um, uh, by the use of refined tube, and he used to examine the trachea. And the same has been done by Chivler Jackson as well, um, um, which considered the, I mean, consider him the, the modern, um, started the modern era of uh, the current rigid bronchoscopy. But not before the 1970s and 80s when the era of the fiber optic came and this actually improves the uh, fiber optic uh, use for the optic resolution. Um, the rigid bronchoscopy used specifically to moderate uh, for moderate and massive hemoptysis um, to obtain um, the, the I mean uh, a potential or an axis or uh, let me say uh, whenever you have a large foreign body based on your I mean, reoperative evaluation and you need um, to extract it, probably the rigid bronchoscopy will be the, the, the good choice. And also to obtain a large biopsy specimen. Um, de definitely, and if we have a compromised latency of the airway due to the granulation tissue, mass or tumor, um, for instance, in the cases of uh, uh, retrostinal goiter. Uh, the, uh, if, we, if you're looking for a, a device which helps to bypass the point of airway obstruction, uh, the best thing to do is to go with the endotracheal tube, I uh, mean to, to do the rigid bronchoscopy, and the, uh, to put an endotracheal tube to bypass the, the site of the point of the obstruction. So uh, I believe that the rigid bronchoscopy, one of the mandatory preparations before uh, a case like this case, for instance, this gentleman had a massive uh, retrostoinal goiter that actually squeezes the trachea, making the trachea width uh, just as low as 0 0.8 to 1.4 centimeters and encouraging the, the front of the neck. And actually, that might cause really a, a critical um, airway obstruction during the induction of anesthesia this way, uh, because of the I believe that the rigid bronchoscopy is a mandatory one. It's a life-saving measure in such a patient. Well, uh, uh, for the flexible, it is really it's a, with, the, with the flexible design would improve the optical resolution. Um, we have a potential to use the flexible fiber optic bronchoscopy and it contains or that one of the main um, uh, things in, in, in the current design of most of our uh, flexible fiber optic bronchoscopy is the presence of the small sized aspirating channels. Definitely it is a smaller compared to the rigid bronchoscopy. So it's not actually um, amalgamating the whole airway and that what really cause a kind of uh, uh, patient comfortability, like making our patient com uh, uh, more comfy whenever being using, uh, whenever we are trying to approach the airway with a flexible fiber optic bronchoscopy. And we can also uh, be able to maneuver our peripheral, um, um, I mean, our fiber optic bronchoscopy to the peripheral lung zone. We can do, go all the way down to the sixth generation of the bronchi, which is actually not really approachable by the, by the rigid bronchoscopy. Um, so it's been used for a difficult airway intubation, uh, for a foreign body extraction, they confirmed the, 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 the position and the isolation of the WM tube, and also for assembling or and getting a suction materials. Well, um, I believe that after we able to go that's a little bit far with the flexible fiber optic bronchoscopy, um, a recent advance has came up with a, with a very nice, um, and let me see, invention um, by the use of electromagnetic um, uh, bronchoscopy. And this actually has been invented and, uh, 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 actually in, in the very lately, I mean, at the beginning of this, um, the 20th first century and it's been widely used especially in the Cleveland Clinic and we are lucky to have one of our colleagues there from uh, Mr. Dr. Theodore from Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. Uh, however um, uh, Cleveland Clinic considered as a one of the leading centers not only in North America and in North America but even in the whole world in the use of such techniques because it contains the, the, the uh, possibility to have biopsy for the lesion even in the peripheral or distant um, uh, lungs zones, um, um, they are mainly using technology that helps really to get a sensor probe which navigates in the tracheal bronchial tree and communicated uh, the location, the exact location using the electromagnetic board converts um, the pictures or I mean, or, or this location uh, based on the CT scan and convert it into a multi-planar 3D image and you can go exactly and you can locate um, all the, um, I mean, the, the desired or the aimed location in order to get the proper biopsy. 
Moreover, we have the EBOS or um, uh, using the ultrasound simply, it's an ultrasound guided and using the convex or radial probe in order to obtain the samples. And by the way, this also been used um, uh, really widely by the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, um, I think 100 or 1000 main web cases currently are replacing the need uh, for the mediastinoscopy in order to obtain enough mediastinal and hilar lymph node biopsies. Well, we, we, we should definitely think about our patients and um, um, uh, on terms of our, our expect, uh, expectation or speculation for what we're going to face inside the theater. So uh, we should expect that those patients having issues with oxygenation on ventilation, they might have a high risk for pulmonary complication, intraoperative or even postoperative. Um, we should also assess the neck and jaw mobility because this is one of the main uh, things that will affect our approach for the airway, reasons of wheezes, rails, ronchi, and strider definitely should be taken in consideration. Our pre-medication depends on the physical status and the lung compliance and the preoperative assessment. Therefore, it might yeah, you might go uh, or you might not choose the the use of the metasolam, but definitely anticylagog, uh, scopolamine, and steroids are very crucial in those patients. You should also consider that uh, we can consider the patient based on their categories. If, if you have an adult patient, for instance, an old age, you should expect that you are going for a bronchoscopy for the tumor or there is a mass, there is a possibility of the airway obstruction. They might have a limited pulmonary reserves. On the other hand, you, when you deal with the pediatrics, um, you should expect that they came to you because they have a foreign body, possibly um, B nuts or hazelnut or um, as usual. Um, by the way, I have, uh, for instance, one time, actually, I've been atheizing an adult patient around 52 years old, and he's been inhaled of the piece of pizza. So it's, it's actually it's not related to the age, uh, but it relates mainly to the, the, what, what, what scenario actually affects your patient. And definitely those pediatrics came, you, came to you with the, an airway obstruction, possibly they have a respiratory stress. Um, so the, this were actually will will judge and really will lead you to the to the choice of the proper anesthetic technique and this definitely depends on the preoperative condition and the indication of your procedure and definitely the duration but actually let me say um simply uh, for the rigid bronchoscopy it's ga and for the fiber optic bronchoscopy you 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 can just have a, a plenty of options starting from the awake mild to moderate or deep sedation and all the way down to GA uh, with, with a tube or with the other choices that we're gonna see uh, this is actually in the upcoming slides. Well, um, it's a GA. So uh, we can use the, the, the usual induction technique like probofol and ketamine. Um, inhalational might be used in a very particular situation based on the patient evaluation. Um, uh, the maintenance usually varies from using the TIVA, uh, rocuronium uh, for complete muscle paralysis. Uh, inhalational anesthetics could be used. Inhalation and TIVA could be used together along with the use of the narcotics like fentanyl, alfentanyl, and remifentanyl. Usually we go with the short acting, probably ultra short acting in order to maintain or to ensure the emer good emergence and rapid recovery in the most operative period. Uh, don't forget that we can also uh, uh, use some adjuvants like the like magnesium. It's really very successful choice if you use it to control the blood pressure and heart rate and the airway reflexes. Uh, other adjuvants like the anticelgog and the steroids. Some use and refer the use of alpha two agonists as well and lidocaine. Um, dealing with the ventilation, usually um, we have three main choices for our ventilation. Let me start first with the flexible fiber optic bronchoscopy, which really due to its flexible design and very slim, um, uh, I mean, the design of the scope compared to the, to the rigid bronchoscopy, this allow you to really to keep the patient spontaneously breathing and you can, or you cannot, I mean, you can add uh, an airway topicalization with the local anesthetics, or you can maintain the spontaneous ventilation uh, throughout the procedure. We have the potential also of using or selecting the apneic ventilation definitely with uh, the rigid bronchoscopy. And we can rely on the either uh, positive pressure ventilation 
with the, uh, via the, the, the sideboard or uh, using the high frequency jet ventilation also in whenever it's needed, whenever needed, I mean, in, in a very particular situation as well. At the end of the procedure, the patients need, need to be either intubated or we can use an LMA to maintain the patient's airway, maintain the ventilation until the patients be ready to be recovered from anesthetics. Uh, let me start with the spontaneous ventilation, and definitely this is a good choice in the flexible, uh, and honestly, it's only for the flexible uh, bronchoscopy, not for the rigid at all, and this maintains the keeping the patient spontaneously breathing, avoid the use of the muscle relaxant, um, using the volatile or IV anesthetics. It, uh, additionally, we can add a topicalization of the local anesthetics or maybe nerve blocks be used uh, based in many reports as well to avoid the tendency of the cough with those patients. And um, uh, you can utilize also the, the use of the suction port of this of your flexible fiber optic bronchoscopy in order to go with the spraying the local anesthetic as you go technique. The flexible fiber optic bronchoscopy are more comfy for the patient. Why? Because it occupies only 10% of the tracheal cross-sectional area. And that's why it can be used easily in, uh, in, in awake patient, allowing this patient really to spontaneously ventilate himself because you have enough room allowing this ventilation. Um, the local anesthetic definitely could be used. You can, you can, you have a plenty of choices using the sedation, starting from the mild, moderate, and deep sedation, and the general anesthetic. Definitely, um, uh, the bronchoscope could be introduced by the endotracheal tube and by the LMA as well. But uh, we uh, usually we go the preference with the larger tubes, like 8.5 and 9, uh, and nine um, uh, sizes, in order to maintain the uh, adequate room for the ventilation around the scope. And uh, for the LMA, usually use either the symbol um, uh, LMA. Um, not the Supreme, definitely. You can use the eye gel, but definitely with the larger sizes. And um, there is an option also of using the, uh, um, the jet ventilation whenever it's needed via uh, a, special, a, special, a specific catheter should be actually threaded or reloaded inside the suction uh, port. Uh, I, I can just take you for the trip through the, the bronchial tree, and you can see we're coming to the carina, right upper, and then middle and lower right uh, loops of the right lung. And then we go back to the carina, main stem, and then going to the left main bronchus to the 50% 50, 50 uh, divisions. And that's why um, uh, going back again to the to the right side, right upper, this is the middle, and then a lower loop and then going back to the carina, to the trachea, and it's a little bit slow. So the left minister bronchus giving 50%, 50% divisions, and we can see the upper and lower bronchi. Actually, you can see now that can be easily been navigating through the bronchial tree, and that's what really explains why it's, it could be used uh, uh, um, uh, flexibly uh, under spontaneous ventilation. Ventilating the uh, the rigid bronchoscopy and it's a little bit hard. The definitely should be should be really fully relaxed, fully paralyzed. Um, uh, we can use the what we call it the ventilated bronchoscope using a glass window is placed over the proximal end. Um, it's easily we can sca scavenging the uh, what whatever I mean the the the, the leaks uh, around the bronchoscope also still maintained and been applied by manual. It could be prevented by the applying the manual pressure over the larynx um, in order to avoid the, uh, the, the, the I mean, extensive leaks from, um, especially leaks might be cause a kind of airway, uh, air pollution and might also affect the ventilation if there is not enough amount of uh, uh, oxygen is being um, really delivered to the tracheal bronchial tree. That's why sometimes we had to, um, to overcome this by applying a pressure around the larynx. But definitely you should expect that the all of I mean all of our stuff, even the surgeons will sleep at the end of the of the day, if you, especially if you have a couple of like three uh, bronchoscopes. Um, you can use the apneic ventilation as well by 
maintaining the patient really apneic throughout the procedure, uh, doing initially um, a denitrogenization, uh, de, uh, denit um, doing a denitrogenization for the, um, the, the patient using a big oxygenation for 100%, uh, starting with the uh, induction of general anesthetics. If you cannot apply the definitely the inhalational, uh, we can re rely on the TIVA with the propofol and remifentanil using the neuromuscular blockers. However, the uh, auto delivery continuously over the 10 or 15 liters, and uh, we can ventilate until the patient really starts to desaturate. I mean, we can maintain the patient apneic, and then uh, you can tell the, your surgeon that we can stop for a while, keep the 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 uh, the port closed, and maintain a pressure over the larynx in order to maintain uh, enough inflation for the lungs, and then he can maintain his own. Um, uh, a procedure. Usually, this technique has been used usually whenever we're trying to get or extract a foreign body from the airway because usually the excessive ventilation might affect um, the, the potential of grasping the, um, the foreign body and might really make the foreign body migrate a little bit further in the airway. That's why we had to stop the ventilation for a while, keeping the patient's uh, apneic, and then allow the surgeon or like a bronchoscopist in, in order to approach the foreign body and take it out. And then you can, if, if you feel that the, your patient is saturated, you can maintain the, your uh, ventilation continuously for a, uh, for a time. Uh, the main disadvantage actually that it, because of this apnea, we have a rise, continuously rise of the uh, um, uh, BACO2, uh, it starts with a six millimeter mercury, then three millimeter mercury consequently, and also awareness, that's why it requires really a deep um, cautious, to be the deep cautiously about the, the, the monitoring the, the depth of anesthetics. Here, you can see that the, this is a rigid bronchoscopy and we have um, the circuit, the normal circuit could be attached to the side board easily. And it looks, it, well, that's what really facilitates the use of, uh, uh, the use of our anesthetic circuit and the use of our ventilators and also maintaining the intermittent positive pressure ventilation throughout the procedure by applying our anesthetic circuits. And you can also use some um, modified ventilatory settings by, by relying on high frequency positive pressure ventilation using uh, volumes of one to two millimeters per kg and respiratory rate in, uh, of 40 per minute, for instance, if you want to apply high frequency positive pressure ventilation. And this also gives you the advantage of using the inhalation and anesthetics. Uh, one of the main advantage here also, they can monitor the ventilation unlike the other alternatives like the high frequency jet ventilation. Um, you can monitor your ventilation, the BACO2 for instance, uh, avoiding uh, the hypoventilation whenever it's needed, whenever needed, and also big airway pressure and big inspiratory pressure. And you can feel the reservoir back and predict if there is a, a drop in the lung compliance and you can assess the ventilation if you need it. Um, uh, definitely, I, I, I should emphasize on the use of the PES and inotropy in those uh, scenarios in order to maintain the really adequate, adequate depth of anesthesia. The, as I mentioned before, the evolution of the airway, of the air, definitely one of the main disadvantage. We come to the high frequency jet ventilation, should be performed by, performed by the handled injector, such as Sanders injector, and it's beneficial definitely in the cases of bronchopleural fistula. Um, uh, it's, it might really um, uh, uh, could be used in a very particular scenarios also, but we should consider also that this is um, not advisable in the case of tracheal narrowing or extent of, um, if there is a severe comp um, uh, compression because actually this might cause ends by uh, delivering a huge uh, extensive positive pressure and it ends by a parotrauma or airway trauma. Do you think that this is a good choice in the case um, if, if we have a, in the time of the COVID that we say if we have a because of COVID positive patient, uh, we're we gonna see this later. Actually, it starts with the auto jet with the 50 BSI, which starts the proximal um, a tube, creating a negative pressure, entrainment of the air, and then creates um, the uh, positive pressure which run through the tube and it ends by inflating the both lungs. The best indicator here is the adequate for, the, for I mean for the adequate for the adequacy of the ventilation at the chest mobility and um, uh, and chest inflation. Um, talk about the complication. 
we have definitely complications related to the anarthritics, including the decrease in lung compliance. The patient may develop hypoxemia, hypoventilation, especially in the apneic ventilation. And you start really to oscillate between the drop in the saturation, and then you have tried to pick it up a little bit. And this actually, it might be stressful for, for, all, for all the anarthritics, um, uh, in the, in especially in the bronchoscopic theaters or bronchoscopy, whenever bronchoscopy is being required, especially in the emergency situations. Also, the hypertension, um, hemodynamic instability in the form of developing hypertension, hypotension, and if hypotension occurs, you should the first thing you should think about is the development of the tension pneumothorax, uh, the presence of tachycardia or arrhythmia, myocardial infarction or ischemia, and those who have a very limited uh, cardiac and cardiorespiratory reserves. Um, the main complication of the Venturi technique is the atmospheric pollution, the airway trauma, hemorrhage. Um, definitely, if we, we it could, could be um, a develop a kind of laceration of the airway, barotrauma, laryngeal spasm, or bron uh, or barotrauma, or it ends by tension pneumothorax, which really should be really taken in consideration. And one of the main also drawbacks is, is sometimes we, we are not able actually to, to provide, especially in the high frequency jet ventilation, we're not able to monitor the proper ventilation and definitely the awareness which should be really taken in our consideration. Um, definitely, when, when, when 2020 come, unfortunately, in the, in the early days of uh, this year, actually came up with, uh, with a lot of concerns and a lot of restriction throughout the world and the fear of uh, really of, the, of getting um, contracted with the virus from, from working in our field, especially we are all of us are actually working in the very near to the airway, um, and the development of the air, 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 aerosol generating procedure will become one of the major concerns really makes the things a little bit difficult for all of us, not only for the um, usual elective surgeries, but even for whenever surgeries like the transnasal bronchial or even laryngeal uh, uh, procedures have been required, especially for the tracheostomy as well. And definitely, perhaps it's, it's good without saying that bronchoscopy is considered as uh, one of the really the critical um, uh, procedure that might really carry on really at a great risk. So just to simplify um, these guidelines, um, we should really consider that the patient should be tested before doing the procedure. Um, those tests at least 24 to 48 hours, not exceeding more than 72 hours. And probably this patient should be asymptomatic. And um, otherwise, um, this patient will, will remain in the uh, amber pathway. Um, just we will deal, you should actually deal only with the asymptomatic patient who have a negative test and remains negative till the time of the surgery. And you will find really a kind of a consensus about this between all the societies, including the ASA, including the Society of Head and Neck, uh, um, head and neck uh, Anesthesia, uh, the Society of Ambulatory Anesthesia. And even if you go even for the Royal College of Anesthetics as well, you have found a very strict guidelines about who is the patient should be really um, um, categorized as a green pathway. Um, because that's actually reflects how this procedure are really very, very uh, uh, difficult and actually do uh, in, in terms of having the possibility of having the aerosol genetic procedure for the whole, not only for the surgeon, even for the anesthetist and even for the nurses as well. But the, we should remember that according to the um, uh, also the Journal of Bronchol uh, Bronchology and Intervention Pulmonology in 2020, uh, the routine bronchoscopy for um, just only for to diagnosing the COVID-19 patients is a relative contraindication. So I think this is one of the main concerns here. It's, it's not a proper choice. I mean, to take really the, um, the fiber optic bronchoscopy or even the rigid bronchoscopy to obtain samples in order to make sure that those patients really as positive or negative, uh, especially for the patients being admitted to the ITU. Uh, here, um, we have the potential to see um, the 
Cleveland Clinic again uh, uh, about the, the recommendation about the priority tiers related to the bronchoscopy. And uh, with this recommendation, simply they will really arrange the patients according to a bundle. So some of the bundle really could be go directly to the theater. Uh, some of them can wait for one to two days if they are, even if they are symptomatic, some of them are considered urgent and can wait up to one to two weeks. Uh, however, there is also another consensus between the um, Cleveland Clinic, uh, the, the Society of Head and Neck um, uh, Anesthetics, um, the American Society, and also the AABIB guidelines show that the, it goes without saying that foreign body aspiration, massive hemoptysis, severe airway stenosis, uh, symptomatic uh, endobronchial obstruction, cancer-related complication, and when it's symptomatic and maybe it becomes a life-threatening, also aerodigestive fistulas, uh, tracheostomy complications are considered really a highly uh, urgent, let me say it could be, could be done immediately, considered an, emergent, uh, an emergency procedure, it can be done definitely after taking the good uh, precautions and all these go, go, good precautions and let me see are the good guidelines or like a proper guidelines appropriate preparation for those surgeries or for those interventions are being also agreed upon all of those um, um, uh, really leaders of uh, our, I mean our um, our practice, like in the Royal College or um, um, the ASA or um, even in, in Cleveland as well. What are those precautions? Definitely, you should wear the full BPE um, using the negative pressure chambers, or let me see, doing this procedure in negative cham and negative pressure suits. Not, not, nothing, not, nowhere else uh, to maintain the safety. You should limit the personnel. Um, use the room trafficking. You should wait after the the aerosol generation. I mean, after the procedure or during the intubation or before the, I mean, after the extubation, you should at least wait at least 35 minutes. And well, um, I was really concerned about the 35 minutes or 20 minutes because in some facilities, um, we sometimes we had to wait only for 20 minutes and some of the, of the areas we just keep it very strict and maintain this waiting period up to one hour. However, uh, at least we should know uh, that the time needed to, for clearing the air uh, for maintaining a 12 air exchange per hour uh, in order to maintain the removal of 99.9% .9 of the airborne infection at least the 35 minutes. And uh, when, whenever it's been left to you to, go to, the main, to, get, to get the proper choice, probably if you have a potential to do that a flexible bronchoscope definitely would be much better than the rigid bronchoscope. But if you if you if you had to choose with a flexible bronchoscope, you had to dis, to go with a disposable bronchoscope if it is available rather than the reusable one. Uh, definitely, you should avoid the nasal route, um, especially under sedation. You should avoid the high frequency nasal oxygenation and free therapy as well. You should use the closed loop system for sampling or even for suctioning as well to maintain to avoid the aerosol generation and to avoid really the splashing of the um, uh, uh, virus through in the in, in our environment moreover um, and, and it's clear uh, um, really uh, an instruction to avoid the high frequency jet ventilation if you're going to use something uh, for uh, the form of the rigid bronchoscopy, you should use the sideboard and you should uh, really connect your anesthetic circuits rather than connecting the high frequency jet ventilation. Uh, definitely, this will really limits the also the AGB. Um, you can use uh, probably it's better to use the apneic ventilation used all with the closed ventilatory circuits and filters should be connected to your uh, circuit. Very simple. If you have to go with the sedation, for instance, in some of the patients, because some of the pulmonologists, especially with the, uh, the EPN or the APOS, um, especially in the Cleveland Clinic, they are doing a plethora of cases actually under the, the aid of the sedation, moderate to deep sedation. But definitely, this comparison really uh, emphasized that really the general anesthetic is much better than the sedation in those patients. In terms of using the semi-closed ventilatory circuits, in terms of the paralysis, which avoids the cough. Therefore, um, you have to 
consider that in, 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 in cases like ENB or APOS, um, definitely the pulmonologist, when they convert it to under sedation, you should expect that you might call you back because the patient is coughing and you had to give them a general anesthetics. So the, the best thing is to do it at least under LMA using the sobraglottic airway, especially it facilitates the use of the flexible bronchoscopy, but definitely you should just get the ideally seated LMA, which was, would be well sealed using the, always the size, the bigger size in order to maintain the adequate sealing of the airway to avoid the leaks. Because currently in this years, I mean, in this era, the, the leaks are no longer tolerated. Uh, using the eye gel is a good choice. Uh, if you, um, uh, you don't use the Supreme and use um, the eye gel or even the conventional, very famous Archie Brain um, LMA. Doing the, 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 the general anesthetic for, for flexible fibrotic bronchoscopy really emphasize on the minimizing the aerosol generating uh, procedure, avoiding the mask ventilation as, 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 you, as much as you can, and also avoiding the cuff during the induction and even during the emergence of the anesthesia. And the main thing is to do the technique, the famous technique, perhaps now currently most of the, our anesthetics around the world, most of our colleagues now are very familiar to this really uh, approaches. Uh, using the rapid sequence induction, adequate neuromuscular paralysis, using rucuronium is a good choice, and reversal with a sugammadex, using the fentanyl in the beginning, I go along with the short acting of yours, and um, also uh, using um, uh, adjuvants like magnesium, lidocaine, ondansetron, and adequate reversal with a sugammadex at, at the end. Uh, definitely, if you if if there is potential of rigid bronchoscope, bronchoscope and which could be bland, um, it it might be really one of the, um, um, I mean, expected scenarios when it starts with the flexible and then the I mean the bronchoscope. Or the thoracic surgeon ask you that we have to go with the rigid bronchoscopy because we cannot obtain enough sample. And then yet currently you are converting from the flexible to the rigid bronchoscopy. In case of this plan, I mean this scenario is expected. Usually go with the apneic ventilation using the Tiva, Propofol, and Remifentanil, and try as much as you can minimize to minimize the post-operative coughing and decrease the aerosol in the um, recovery room. Uh, uh, same approaches actually has been applied for the, whenever uh, a biopsy is needed, I mean, required for uh, um, uh, 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 procedures like in the EPS or APOS or uh, EPN. So um, the, it's similar, especially because sometimes, you know, um, it's a little bit uh, getting the biopsy from the mediastinum or maybe from the very distant lung zones requires the patient really to be very well controlled under general anesthetics, at least by the use of the LMA. If you couldn't, you can just intubate and put, uh, allow the, I mean, the bronchoscopist to, to stay um, uh, relaxed until he get his own uh, biopsy. And also, uh, I, I really recommend really to see this narrative um, experience by um, Orsola Galloway and actually, uh, actually describing all of those um, proper approaches in the, 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 done under the uh, umbrella of the Cleveland Clinic. Well, for take home message, um, definitely it's really it's, to maintain the safety and the success of such procedure, we need a very, very intimate collaboration, mutual um, discipline from all the people in this, um, I mean, uh, all the stuff in the, in the, in the theater, um, having a skillful and experienced clinician is a, is a cornerstone to approach the airway from our side of the anesthetic and as well as the, from, the surgical, uh, uh, from the surgical side as well. Equipments and facilities should be prepared and we should tailor our, um, our techniques and our preparation according to the available scenario. Definitely, it's a risky, highly stim stimulating procedure, especially in the time of the COVID. Um, uh, this actually added more escalating risks for the anesthetist surgical, and as well as our dear nursing teams. Um, uh, the recognition of those risks and the careful adoption, careful adoption for the techniques and setups are mainly required to ensure the optimal patient's care. Um, the specific preoperative approaches had been widely applied in order to modify our commonly employed practice, not only in the bronchoscopy, by the way, but more in most of our um, uh, daily practice, especially when it really been affect, 
affects, I mean, the COVID affects our potential actually to be exposed to more risks. And that's why we should ensure adequate safety and preparation for our stuff, along with keeping our service running. Um, I believe that, uh, I hope that actually um, uh, 2020 is being kicked out with, the, with, with all its very sad and very nasty memories. And I hope that 2021 will carry on um, a good thing for all of us. Uh, either treatment or vaccine or whatever. And uh, thank you very much for, for all of you. Thank you, Dr. Ahuda. Thank you, Dr. Yasser. And thank you, thank you Dr. Saad, for your, really, for your invitation and for your kind efforts with me throughout this um, presentation. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Haytham. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, what I would like to thank you is you, just, you didn't just give us how to manage uh, how the COVID changed uh, our practice, you refreshed our memory in the beginning with the bronchoscopy itself. Thank you for this very much. Uh, we don't have many questions, actually. It's just one question from uh, Muhammad Ahmad Ali. He's asking about uh, an example of anti medications that uh, we can give. Yeah, well, um, this has actually been used. Um, uh, let me say the Phenergan, for instance. I've been using the Phenergan for some particular patient because it actually might reduce a little bit uh, um, the cough and helps the um, the the airway, especially in the in the pediatric patients. I mean, um, some of the patients actually might take obviously a toblic seal or. Um, um, uh, 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 in many reports as well, we're considering, you know, the fentanyl and the propofol as anti medications. So uh, even the, that's why they are re emphasizing on the fact that we can use the fentanyl when a dose of one to two microgram as an anti initially before the, giving the uh, propofol or even starting. This definitely stops the, the cough. This is for the other, but in, definitely for the pediatric, the Fenergan, for instance, could be used as an, a pre-medication for those patients. Mm. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Haytham and uh, uh, Dr. Coleman. I think you kindly uh, answered all the questions that we have uh, that we had uh, earlier and couldn't answer. Uh, I think this is it for the day. Um, thank you all, everyone, and. Uh,